The priest quivered as he grasped his amulet between his thumb and index finger, murmuring prayers underneath his breath. Shelves were tipped and splintered against stone, braziers were kicked, and their coals burst across the floor, ash plumed and choked. He watched as his priory was molested, his shrines to the divines were desecrated, his flock taunted by loathsome bandits who stripped them of any valuables. The crash of smashed glass echoed the chapel, then was the clang of the chandelier cut from its fastening. Their leader was known to the priest a local farm boy who fought in the Great War, and he had returned changed and marred by the malevolence of warfare. The bandits were shouting and restraining the others, harassing the women and children with their muddied and scarred faces. Their leader crushed the pews with his mace, splintering wood, shouting about how gods, empire, and false brothers had turned their eyes from the elven menace that slaughtered their own in exchange for peace, a betrayal of all those who had shed blood for their just cause. The leader left that chapel behind him that night, burning under twilight, resolute that he had shown and will continue to show what true torment is. Molag Bao, Lord of Troubles, Tormentor of Men, Sower of Strife, and King of Corruption. He is the Daedric Prince of Domination. He seeks the enslavement of all mortal souls, and for that which he cannot directly control, he seeks to spread the rotten stink of his corruption to anything he touches, leaving them with the taint of Molag. In the ancient tongue of Elnifex, the language of the Elnifei, Molag Bal translates directly to Firestone. The desired effect here is certain. Firestone conjures within the mind typical hellish imagery, and Bal's appearances in both physical form and statue have always depicted him as some form of monstrous beast, always with a tail and horns, and in some early depictions he is shown with hooves which furthers a goat-like appearance, exaggerating the satanic imagery. It is clear Molag Baal is intended to be the devilish Satan figure of the Elder Scrolls universe, but is there something more to him than that? Is he really just cruelty manifest, or is there perhaps more of a fallen angel here than we first realize? I doubt anything about this Daedric Prince could have ever been described as angelic, however, there is much more to Molag Bal than first meets the eye. This Lord of Schemes may seem one-dimensional, an evil-for-evil's sake type god, but today we're going to lay out many theories and connections using psychological analysis and comparative mythology to construct an interesting view of this Daedra, one that may explain the way he is, a tragedy told not to justify, but to understand this capricious king of the cruel. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, there is much to lay out and discuss, so let's get into it. The exact origins of a Daedric Prince are always rather elusive. Sometimes, as in the case with the previous Daedric Prince we discussed, Hermaeus Mora, we could identify his status as an Erdra, one of the eldest beings likely born when time first began. But with Molag Bal, we have less information, and remember, making a chronological coherence of myth is often a fruitless endeavor. However, in both the 36 Lessons of Vivek and the Mythic Dawn commentaries, Two, I should say, dubious and secondary sources, beautiful nonetheless and not to be disregarded, Molag Bal is described as the chief of the dregs who once ruled all the world in the Dawn Era or a previous Kalpa, though they're kind of the same thing. For those unaware, a Kalpa is essentially a universal cycle. The gist of it is that time starts at the Dawn Era, it follows through the eras until an apocalypse of sorts, Alduin eats the world in Nordic myth or in Yakutan myth, Satakal eats its own tail until it consumes itself entirely, and the end of the previous Kalpa becomes the dawn of the next. So there is never really a clear ending and beginning. The easiest way to think about it is that the Dawn Era is the ending of the old world and the beginning of the next. All the known history of the Elder Scrolls from the Dawn Era to the 201st year of the Fourth Era takes place within a singular Kalpa. Yet there are many mythological texts, like the ones we are discussing, that allude to the happenings of the previous Kalpa, or rather, the end of the previous Kalpa and the dawn of the current. Though, for reasons self-explanatory, they are incredibly hard to verify. Regardless, Sermon 28 of the 36 Lessons of Vivek says, when the dregs ruled the world, the Daedroth Prince Molag Bal had been their chief. He took a different shape then, spiny and armored and made for the sea. And yes, dreg is referring to those crustacean-like creatures you find on land or in the sea, which according to myth were the tyrants of the world. The mythic dawn commentaries say, 
The Mundex Terrain was once ruled over solely by the tyrant Dreg Kings, each to their own dominion, and border wars fought between their slave oceans. They were akin to the time totems of old, yet evil and full of mockery and profane powers. No one that lived did so outside of the sufferance of the Dregs. In another of the lessons of Vivek, a story is told of the Ruddy Man, where it is said that a Velothi child once found the dead carapace of an old image of Molag Bal, and when he wore it to scare his village, he was transformed, or rather corrupted, into a monster known as the Ruddy Man. Of course, these sources all exist firmly within the realms of mythological storytellings or supposed divine revelations, but with Molag Bal, it's as good as it gets with an origin. So, to simply recap, Molag Bal was the chief of the tyrant drag kings who ruled the world in the Dawn Era. This is no longer the case, clearly, and as the Mythic Dawn commentaries would say, it was the Magna Gi who created Merun's Dagon in the bowels of Lig, and it was he who liberated the world from the tyrants then. We can go far more into depth with this in a Dagon video, but it is important to keep in mind because it will help us inform us of the nature of those two gods' relationship. In Dunmeri mythology, Molag Bal is said to have been born at Bal Ur on Vardenfell, the name roughly translating to earliest stone. And interestingly, the arch canon of the Tribunal Temple says that it was here where the Doom Drum, which is a name for Lorcan, tricked Molag Bal into becoming a mortal, and this is where Vivek defeated Molag Bal and sent him back to oblivion. As far as I'm aware, there is no other mention of Lorcan tricking Molag Bal into becoming a mortal anywhere else, but that aside, I feel as if we've spoken enough about his origins, you've got a bit to think about, and just keep them in mind, because they will be the basis of later speculation, but for now, let us return to the fundamentals. Molag Bal, at his core, is a Daedric Prince of Domination. Like Hermaeus Mora seeks total knowledge, Molag Bal seeks total ownership, and that which he cannot grasp, he touches with his corruption. Cold Harbor is his realm, pervaded by a miasma of fear where lost souls are tormented for an eternity. It is a place made in mockery of Nern, a desolate and apocalyptic version of the mortal world, and in some places it is not a mere mimicry of Nern, but in fact actual stolen pieces small expressions of his ultimate desire which was attempted with the apocalyptic event known as the Plain Meld that took place in the 582nd year of the Second Era. Here, Molag Bal would make a deal with the King of Worms, Manamarco, and several other Imperial traitors, and together they would conspire and successfully begin the process which would have Mundus merged with Cold Harbor through absence of the Amulet of Kings and the use of his Dark Anchors. And to support this invasion, he would host legions of Daedra, among them Winged Twilights, Dramora, Scamps, Clan Fear, the classic host of typical Lesser Daedra, but with icy eyes and blue-gray skin, marks of Molag Bal's ownership. It is also worth noting that as a Daedric Prince of Domination, his Daedric servants are subject to strict uniform rules that determine how they must act, outlined in the 701 Edicts. Failure to adhere to the letter may result in excruciating punishment in the scathe rings, such as second degree gradual incorporation. Sounds rough, but I guess this style of leadership works for him, considering the hosts of Daedra he commands. But the pinnacle of his armies is a Daedra of his own creation. The Zivkin, a hybridization of Dramora and Zivili, the result of an experiment committed in his vile laboratory, a place in Cold Harbor, a place where all manner of monstrosities were created. It is here that he created the very first Daedric Titan. Bozik Kodstrun, a dragon that went into hiding at the end of the Dragon Wars, was tricked and captured by Molag Bal, where he was tormented and stripped of his flesh, and from his bones and with foul experimentation, the first Daedric Titan was created. The trend here with Molag Bal is clearly corruption. His realm, a corruption of Mundus, his servants, corruptions, and twisted versions of pre-existing forms, and of course, we cannot forget his corruption of life. The following passages are from the book Opusculus Lamei Bal Ta Mesamorti. As brighter grows light, darker becomes shadow. So it passed that the Daedra Molag Bao looked on Arche and thought the Aedra prideful of his dominion over the death of man and myrrh, and it was sooth. Bal, whose sphere is the wanton oppression and entrapment of mortal souls, sought to thwart Arche, who knew that not man nor myrrh nor beast folk of all known could escape eventual death. The Aedra was doubtless of his sphere, and so Molag Bal set upon Nern to best death. 
Tamriel was still young and filled with danger and wondrous magic when Bal walked it in the aspect of a man and took a virgin, Lemay Balefag, from the Nedic peoples. Savage and loveless, Bal profaned her body and her screams became the shrieking winds which still haunt certain winding fjords of Skyrim. Shedding a lone droplet of blood on her brow, Bal left Nern, having sown his wrath. Violated and comatose, Lemay was found by nomads and cared for. A fortnight hence, the nomad weird woman enshrouded Lemay in Pole, for she had passed into death. In their way, the nomads built a bonfire to immolate the husk. That night, Lemay rose from her funeral pyre and sat upon the coven, still aflame. She ripped the throats of the women, ate the eyes of the children, and raped their men as cruelly as Bal had ravished her. And so Lemay, who is known to us as the Blood Matron, imprecated her foul aspect upon the folk of Tamriel and begat a brood of countless abominations from which came the vampires, most cunning of the night horrors. And so was the scourge of undeath wrought upon Tamriel, cruelly mocking Arke's rhythm of life and death through all the coming errors of the Etada. And for all his sadness, Arke knew this could not be undone. For this reason, Molag Bal is called the father of vampires, a profane mockery of mortality made to spite R.K. While many vampires have descended from Lemay and the bloodlines that spawned from her, Molag Bal has also personally sought to spread vampirism himself. The ritual involved in creating a pure strain vampire known as a daughter of Cold Harbor is not unlike the process which Lemay herself suffered. The entire existence of vampirism is a corruption of life, born of a corruption of sex, instead of the typically love-attraction-based interaction which often results in the birth of new life, we have the hate-fueled act of Baal, which instead of creating new life, creates undeath, an inversion. To experience the cruelty of Molag Bal personally is to endure horror itself. His most infamous relic is aptly named the Mace of Molag Bal, sometimes called the Vampire's Mace or the Master's Mace. It's an enchanted mace that drains the victim's power and can even capture their soul. The perfect weapon of torment for this Daedric Prince, and one that has often been given as a reward to champions who would seek his favor. Yet for a weapon of such malevolent presence, it has been used in some of the most subtle ways. In the third era, Molag Bal sought out a champion to sway a man named Melus Petilius from his pacifist ways, and the champion did so by planting the mace nearby and antagonizing the man at the grave of his wife, pushing him to the edge of violence and tipping him over, which sends him into a rage where he takes the mace and beats the champion to death with it. The champion is given new life by Molag, but Melus lives forever with the torment and guilt of his broken vows. It's also worth noting that the mace is a glorified beating stick, and I just want to mention that because it's fitting for a Daedric Prince who wants to inflict pain until a subject submits. His cruelty is not only that which he inflicts personally either. Hosts of cultists and clans carry out heinous crimes in his name. The Cinderheart clan of the Reachmen are infamous for their cruel treatment of captives on whom they perform a subversion of their traditional Briarheart ritual. They tear open the captive's chest cavity, not to bind a Briarheart, but instead to fill it with hot coals. A truly gruesome way to die. The unwilling sacrifice seems to be the perfect kind to please Molag Bal, and all manner of brutality is conducted by his cults, whether that be blackmail, extortion, or even child abduction. And all the more common amongst his followers is those that practice the black arts of undeath, necromancy. Most recognizable is his dealings with the King of Worms, Manamako, and their shared plan to enact the plane meld. But less so talked about, and all the more interesting in my opinion, is his relationship with the Slowed. Slowed are renowned necromancers and notorious for the lack of morality that other denizens of Tamriel share. Clinical, cautious, and without a care for their own, this race of Thras will boil their very own young into a soap for purposes of arcane ritual. They have been seen purchasing huge piles of corpses for experiments and undead labor. They're not a friendly bunch, and they often engage in deals and arrangements with Daedric Princes, and after they had unleashed the Thracian Plague upon Tamriel, and Benduolo and, and his All Flags Navy sought reprisal, their Great Tower of Coral plunged into the sea, and below it the Maelstrom of Baal formed, drawing it into the depths, sucking it into Baal's realm of Cold Harbor, perhaps a last-ditch effort to save themselves by calling upon their god. 
So it's clear to see by now that Molag Bal has wrought untold destruction, torment, and corruption upon the mortal plane. But is it really only just because it's his nature? I think to reduce Molag Bal to a mere engine or expression of hatred and domination to be a potential disservice to his character. A while ago on one of our podcasts, a commenter named Monsieur Dorgat said this, Molag's main drivers are insecurity and fear. When Mehrin's Dagon brought him low in Lig, possibly tormenting him, following the archetype of abuser, abuse making the abuser, he is entitled and insecure, thinks he's not as strong as he should be, but demonstrates power over others, a sort of bully and spousal abuser archetype. He stands down when bested, afraid of any who can successfully stand up to him. Molag Bal wants love and feels deeply unloved, and Vivek proceeds to seduce him, and he reveals that he was only trying to seduce him to get the secret of Kim in the 36 lessons. Maybe he is the king of rape because he's never had a healthy consensual relationship. So we thought this commenter had a rather compelling idea, and I've been digging through the lore to find and support and flesh out all of this analysis of Molag Bell. So let's begin contextualizing everything in some form of chronological tale. And additionally, I want to bring in two other Daedric princes that are vital for us to help understand Molag Bell. The first part is describing the events that are told in the Mythic Dawn commentaries. The story goes that Molag Bell was the chieftain of the tyrant Dregs, who ruled over all of Mundus, and it was the Magna Gi that gathered and created Mehrunes Dagon in the bowels of Lig as a symbol of hope whose purpose was to rise up and tear down tyranny. He was the Red Rebellion, the Sea's Flame Redeemer. Now, at the top of this regime was Molag Bal as the chief of the dregs, and in order to topple the regime, Mehrunes presumably would have had to fight Molag Bal and beat him into submission, and from this point forward, Molag Bal was shamed. The bully was bullied. But within Molag Bal, this did not humble him, but instead only strengthened his penchant for the abuse of others, and only furthermore, through insecurity, drove his need to dominate and control. Perhaps one could argue that he projects this domineering and powerful demeanor because deep down he is afraid, fearful of any who could challenge him, so he seeks to dismay them by puffing his chest. By the way, this is not to say he's not powerful, he's a Daedric Prince after all, and clearly he possesses power vastly beyond that of any mortal. However, among the gods, the story is different, and this general premise of abused becoming the abuser can be further seen through some of these relationships. First, let's talk about the second example Dorgat mentioned in his comment, that of his interactions with Vivek, the tribunal god described in the 36 lessons of Vivek. Let's get into the whack job stuff. The following is from Sermon 12. Then Vivek Vivek left the capital of Veloth and wandered far into the ash. He found a span of badlands to practice his giant form. He made of his feet a less dense material than the divine to keep from falling waist deep into the earth. At this point, the first corner of the House of Troubles, the Prince Molag Bal, made his presence known. Vivek looked on the King of Rape and said, how very beautiful you are that you do not join us. And Molag Bal crushed the warrior poet's feet, which were not invulnerable, and had legions cleave them off. Mighty fires from the beginning place were brought like nets to hold Vivek, and he let them. I would prefer, he said, some kind of ceremony if we are to be married. And the legions that took the feet were summoned again and ordered to begin a banquet. Pomegranates sprang from the badlands and tents were raised. A throng of Velothi mystics came, reading the passages of the severed feet on the ground and weeping until the scriptures were wet. We must love each other briefly, Vivek said. If at all, I am needed to counsel the Hortator in more important matters because the Duomeri high priests stir up trouble. You may have my head for an hour. Molag Bal rose and extended six arms to show his worth. They were decorated in runes of seduction and its reverse. They were decorated in the annotated calendars of longer worlds. When he spoke, mating monsters fell out. Where must it go, he said. I told you, Vivek said. I am meant to be the teacher of the king of the earth. A. Altadun Gartok Padom. With these magic words, the king of rape added another. Kim which is the secret syllable of royalty. Vivek had what he needed from the Daedroth, and so married him that day. So the gist of it in less poetic and arguably less crazy terms is that Vivek had sex with Molag Bell in order to gain the secret syllable of royalty that is Kim. Now we won't dive in and explore that, but just understand that Vivek through his marriage or union with Molag Bell 
he was able to gain esoteric knowledge that would further his own ends. In a way, Vivek used Molag Bal here. They gave him love, in some fat quotation marks, in order to gain knowledge from him. Not unlike a courtesan spy who gathers information from clients to be sold. The commenter Dorgat suggests that this using of Molag Bao later reveals to him that he is unlovable, and if he will not be given love, then he shall take it and force it, hence his title. So far, this view of Molag Bao depicts him as an inherently insecure and fearful deity that must force his will onto others so that there is no room for betrayal or subversion. To build upon this idea, we can actually have a deep look into his relationships with two other deities, Azura and Meridia. Khajiit mythology is going to come in and save the day with some cool bits and stories for us to bounce off. In the book Adversarial Spirits by the silent priest Amun Dro, it says about Molag Bal this, Molag, one of the twelve demon kings, elder spirit of domination and supreme law, this demon was the first to assault the lattice with intent, alongside Dagon and Merid Nunda. Boethra and Molag fought to a standstill before the lattice, but it was Azura, who shackled the Demon King with secrets only she knows. He will test you, and you will overcome him with the might of Boethra, the will against rule. To quickly bring people up to speed, the Lunar Lattice is what the Khajiit are bound to, it is what determines their forms, but it's also the liminal barrier of Mundus that protects against the Void. So, Merlag Bal was the first demon to assault that barrier with intent, alongside Meirin's Dagon and Merid Nunda, aka Meridia. Which is very interesting because typically throughout history, Molag and Meridia are pitted against one another. It was also during the events of the plane meld that the Vestige helped Meridia to undermine Molag Bal's attempted plane meld. And even as far back as the Aelids of the early First Era, the Aelids of the city Arbogalus, devoted to Molag Bal, fought a war against Meridia worshipping Aelids of the neighbouring city Delodil. It was here in Abogalus that Molag Bal bestowed the King Enumeril with the knowledge to construct a dangerous weapon known as the Mortum Vivicus, a large orb of cold light, a massive spell capable of purging thousands of souls. This was sought to be used during the plane meld, but prevented by the Vestige, while using the Prismatic Core, a tool of Meridia designed for this purpose. Clearly there's a lot of animosity between the two, but as we will talk about later, there is some interesting speculation to be had there. And as for the other aligned Daedra, Mehrunes Dagon, well, Molag and Mehrunes are bitter rivals for reasons clear, as they're in direct opposition when Dagon fought the dregs and brought them to dust in the dawn, and even beyond that, their very spheres are opposed. Molag is of supreme law and domination, a tyrant incarnate, where Mehrunes Dagon is the eternal upstart, an engine of ambition, a hope for those who wish to rebel and bring forth revolution, essentially anti-establishment. Regardless, here, these three Daedric Princes are the first in Khajiiti mythology to assault the Lunar Lattice with intent. In response, Azura and Boethra, aka Boethia, fought them off. Boethra engaged Molag directly and fought him to a standstill. It's worth noting that in the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall faction data, Boethia is listed as an enemy of Molag Bal, and to expand upon this further, both in Dunma and Khajiiti mythology, these entities are fundamentally opposed. To the Dunma, Molag Bal is one of the four corners of the House of Troubles, alongside Dagon, Sheogorath, and Malakath. And for those unfamiliar, the House of Troubles are essentially Daedra to be appeased, avoided, and represent tests for the Dunma people as opposed to their three good Daedra, Azura, Boethia, and Mephala. Specifically, Molag Bal tries to corrupt Dunma purity by tainting their bloodlines, and this is directly opposed to Boethia, who to the Dunma is essentially their founding Daedra, having shown the Prophet Veloth the Triangle Truth, which is the basis for their faith, and also helped them escape the pursuit of Trinimac, and helped them build their very foundations of their clan and house structure. And to the Khajiit, Boethra is the patron of warriors and rebellious exiles, a spirit not worshipped but imitated by following her path, a spirit that always questions authority, antithesis to the total authority Molag Bal seeks. And thematically, of course, rebellious exiles and demon kings of supreme law don't mesh well together. Boethia seeks strength in others, would have them usurp and rebel. Molag Bal seeks strength only for himself, so he can rule in totality. Even in Molag Bal's quest in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, you have Molag Bal seeking to break a priest of Boethia. The reasons they are opposed is clear, but let's get back to the quote we're dealing with. Boethra and Molag fight to a standstill until Azura, quote, shackled the demon prince with a secret only she knows. Now this is interesting. Molag Bal bound and stopped by a secret. 
There is endless speculation to be had here, but let us first briefly contextualize Azura and her secrets. In the origins of the Khajiiti mythos, Azura is gifted by her mother Fatimai three secrets. One would change her chosen people into the Khajiit, and she told them the second secret, which means they then had a responsibility to defend that secret, and as a result, they were bound to the lunar lattice. And when Azura spoke the third secret, moonlight shone upon the marshes of elsewhere and crystallized, creating moon sugar. Azura is clearly associated with secrets and forms of esoteric or exclusive knowledge, alongside things like magic and prophecy. So with that known, what could this possible secret be that she shackled Molag Bal with? Again, to bring up Daggerfall faction data, Azura is actually allied with Molag Bao. Now, of course, lore develops over time, and the Daedric Princes of the Elder Scrolls II are quite different and less developed compared to their contemporary counterparts, so this kind of lore doesn't exactly stack up with what we know now. However, it is worth speculating on. What if, hear me out here, what if the secret Molag was shackled with was love? That is, love from Azura. Less so in Khajiiti interpretations, but in the rest of Tamriel, Azura is noted for her vanity and desire to be loved. While she retains the Dusk Dawn symbology, all the magic, the prophecy, she's also seen as quite a vain and egotistical Daedra. She wants to be loved devotedly by her followers. It is why the tribunal's betrayal of her is taken so poorly, and she curses the entire race with grey skin and red eyes making the Dunma. So what if the secret Azura shackled Molag Bao with? was actually her love. This may sound strange, and yes, this is wild speculation, but as we established earlier, Merlag Bao feels deeply unloved and desperately wants to feel it, but because of this fear of being unlovable and the insecurity associated with it, this manifests in a desire to control, to dominate, and to take the love of others, which of course is not really love, is it? Maybe Azura shackled him, meaning to bind him, to stop him, by loving him or feigning to. It's the one thing that may take him by surprise and stop him. It's a strange take, I know, but I also want to have a look at Merlag Bal's children to show you another little connection here. Now, of course, among the Daedra, the nature of relationships mean different things. Familial relationships do not have to be as literal as those of mortals. However, Molag Bal does have a child named Molag Grunda, and it would so happen that this daughter appears to be a winged twilight, a lesser Daedra most associated with Azura. I mean, clearly, Azura, the queen of dusk and dawn, has winged twilights as her servants. To be fair, like Lesser Daedra, you can find them in the service of other princes, but what if Molag Grunda is actually the offspring of both Azura and Molag Bal? When Molag Bal was shackled with the love of Azura, unable to move or act in the face of a genuine show of love, paralyzed by it for he believed he was unlovable, perhaps a child in the likeness of Azura's Lesser Daedra was, was born of their union, Molag Grunda, the Winged Twilight. It is in Azura's doctrines that she desires her followers to love themselves, and perhaps for a time when she shackled Molag Bal with genuine love, he could love himself. But of course, this was likely not genuine and a mere tool to do away with a raging demon king assaulting the lattice, and perhaps this would come to light later on, simply ratifying what Molag Bal knew, that he was unlovable, and reinforcing his need to abuse and control. If this speculation were to be true, then both Azura and Vivek have loved Molag Bal untruthfully and for purposes of their own ends. I do just want to reinforce here that all of this analysis is not to find a justification for the evils of Molag Bal, but to understand potentially what allowed this evil to manifest or to expand. And of course he truly is evil, that much is as clear, as clear as his insecurity. If all this analysis and speculation is to be seen as true, then his desire to torment, to dominate, and to own is largely a result of his need to prove himself to somehow make him lovable by committing heinous cruelties, a kind of misguided inversion, where he thinks that if on some deep level, if all is under his control, then he will be loved. Somehow he can inflict a Stockholm Syndrome type scenario on all. And remember, feel free to disagree with this interpretation, but it's worth noting that Malakath, the Daedric Prince of the Scorned, actually says something about Molag Bal to sort of support this when you bow before him. Do you think I require supplication? Do you mistake me for Molag Bal? A statement which implies that Malakath thinks Molag Bal's desire for supplication is synonymous with his weakness and need for recognition. A small point, but worthwhile mentioning. The Azura Molag Bal connection is interesting, but now let's talk a little bit about some of the other worldly interactions of Bal. 
The Cold Harbor Compact. In the late First Era, the Mad King of Senchal communed with Molag Bal, asking of him to destroy the Valenwood town of Gliverdale, for a Bosma bar that angered him had come from there. Gliverdale was destroyed in its entirety, and this prompted Sotha Sil, the clockwork god of the tribunal, to summon eight Daedric princes, among them Azura, Boethia, Hermaeus Mora, Hersene, Malakath, Meirun's Dagon, Molag Bal, and Sheogorath, and had them swear to the Cold Harbor Compact, which was supposed to restrict the princes from directly manifesting on Nern, preventing cases such as Gliverdale from happening. The actual terms of the compact outside of this are unknown, with Sotha Sil either being able to threaten them or to be able to offer them something in exchange. In the case of Hermaeus Mora, his seekers are overheard talking about how Hermaeus made a pact to cease all direct interaction in the affairs of Mundus, and that he was paid a great price for it, something he really desired. However, in the case of Meirun's Dagon, it would seem more a threat. And when he broke the terms of the pact mere months later by destroying Mournhold, Sotha Sil sealed off his realm, the Deadlands, from Nern, blocking all access for Dagon. Anyways, the key thing of note here is that it was Molag Bal's destructive actions that brought about the Cold Harbor Compact, and perhaps not desiring to be one-upped by Meirun's Dagon, Molag Bal followed suit in breaking the compact by beginning the plane meld. But with that spoken about, let's refocus on Molag Bal and his relationship with Meridia. We touched on how the ancient Aelid cities of Abagalus and Deladil, who worshipped Bal and Meridia respectively, had a great rivalry. And of course, on the surface, when one looks at the two Daedric princes, father of vampires and harvester of souls versus lady of light and bane of the undead, well, it makes sense that they're opposed. And if we look to the Mythic Dawn commentaries and take them at face value, well, it says that the Magna Gi created Meirun's Dagon, who in turn brought down Molag Bal and the Tyrant Drex. And the point here is that Meridia was once one of the Magna Gi before being banished to oblivion for consorting with illicit spectra, an ill-defined term with several potential identities. But in Khajiit mythology, interestingly, we have Meridia with Dagon and Molag Bal assaulting the Lunar Lattice together. Perhaps it makes sense for Meridia and Dagon to ally in the early days, since after all, the Magna Gi created him, but Molag Bal and Meridia teaming up seems like a hard sell, let alone Meirun's Dagon and Molag Bal, the bitter rivals that they are. I've read some interesting takes among the community, and one post I would like to link down below, but it's really quite a layered theory, drawing in many of the more complex and not strictly canon or out of canon elements of the Elder Scrolls lore, but its general thesis is that Molag Bal is in love with Meridia in his own warped way, like that of a creepy stalker who wants to wear your skin kind of love. But check out the post linked to get a full description. It's rather intense. However, generally running with this premise, Perhaps she, like Vivek, and maybe even Azura, leveraged Molag Bal's desire for love by feeding into it. But like the others, she duped him and merely used him for her own ends. In this case, assaulting the Lunar Lattice with he and Meirun's Dagon. It's worth noting in Khajiit mythology, Meridia is known as the Consort of Demons, and Molag is named one of the Twelve Demon Kings. Perhaps it was this desperation for approval and for love that Molag Bal would suffer working with Meirun's Dagon for a common goal, because Meridia asked of him. And if you doubt the idea that there could ever be a kind of love or at minimum a shared goal between the two, consider that both of these Daedra despise free will. Yet they approach the problem of it through different means. Molag Bal seeks to amass so much power to exert his will over others, forcing their submission by external pressure, whereas Meridia, seeking perfect order, desires the removal of free will in its entirety, such as can be seen with her purified servants, once mortals stripped of their free will and perfected according to her. Is it so crazy to suggest that these two Daedric princes could not have found a united interest, perhaps even love, within a shared goal? A love once shared, since betrayed, and turned into a bitter hatred of one another. It's an interesting thought. But the thing of note is that Molag Bal's insecurity and drive to be loved causes him to, when denied, or when that love is withdrawn or proven false, to take it for himself. Hence we have the tormenting, dominating bully that is Molag Bal. Again, this is not justification, 
but analysis. There are many who have been broken up with, lied to, and cheated on without having to then go and become the literal Satan of a universe. But this all fits in perfectly with Molag Bal's theme of corruption. Like I brought up before in regards to vampirism, Molag Bal loves to corrupt, to control, and to mark as his own. It is a sick and twisted inversion of love, and even stranger that, if this theory analysis is to be believed, that it is spawned from the desire to have love, to be shown love willingly. What he cannot have, or those that will not give themselves to him, he torments, the opposite of affection. He coerces, he dominates, the opposite of willing union, and he corrupts, spreading his sickness and own inner pain onto others. In many ways, he is simply the abuser archetype, and I tend to agree with Dorgat's comment quite broadly. And while this analysis all exists within the realms of comparative mythology and wild speculation, well, that's Elder Scrolls for you, it is by far at least to me the more interesting approach to a Daedric Prince that has so often been displayed as just Satan. And while we have no fallen angel here, we do have a reason to his horror, no matter how unhinged the logic. That was fun, thank you for joining me on it. The Daedric Princes are the best part of the Elder Scrolls lore and I'm excited to be delving into more of them like I did today. And I would ask you to like the video in support of this content if you enjoyed, subscribe for more of these Daedric Prince explorations and please do comment below and contribute to the theory crafting and conversation. It's one of the greatest parts of the Elder Scrolls. There is so much room for it, so much room for theory crafting and interpretation and discussion. So let's get into it. Thank you all again so much for watching. My name is Scott from Fudge Muppet, and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.